All right, y'all. Uh, we're going to move right into our opening plenary. We are going to talk about reimagining the Twin Cities. We got a little bit of a taste of the things that are being done to make uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul a very different region, a, a much more thriving region in terms of equity and sustainability. Uh, and so we're going to bring up our panelists so they can continue the conversation. Um, and so the first person I am going to bring up is Russ Adams. Russ Adams is the executive director for the Alliance for Metropolitan Stability. He's been the executive director since 1995. He has worked as a nonprofit advocate and community organizer since 1985. And during this time, he has helped to build community coalitions in support of economic and racial justice, sustainable and equitable development, access to green jobs, better land use and urban growth policies, uh, minority owned businesses, women develop workforce development, hiring goals for women, community-led transit-oriented development alongside regional transit ways, and has challenged public officials, like Mayor Jacob Fry, to address environmental justice concerns. All right, everybody, let's get a hand for Russ Adams. He's gonna hang out right there. All right, uh, we're gonna bring up another Russ. This is uh, Russ Stark. Russ Stark is the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of St. Paul, working in Mayor Melvin Carter's office. Previously, Russ served for 10 years on the St. Paul City Council, including three years as council president. Prior to his public service, he worked at nonprofits focused on community development, environmental advocacy, and improved transportation options, including early planning for what is now the Green Line Light Rail tra Transit, which some of y'all will be taking later today. Russ has a bachelor's in political science from Swarthmore College and a master's of urban affairs and public policy from the University of Delaware. Let's give it up for Russ. And we are going to welcome Sean Pierce next. Uh, Sean Pierce is the Economic Development and Inclusion Policy Director to Mayor Jacob Fry. Uh, she is a public policy, capacity development, nonprofit management, government relations professional, and innovative strategist with a flair for community focused leadership in corporate and nonprofit settings. She has 16 year demonstrated history mobilizing community members of all ages, genders, ethnicities, and backgrounds to take action toward a more economically and socially fulfilling society. Let's give it up for Sean. I'd also like to welcome Laura Zabel, the Executive Director for Springboard for the Arts. She is, uh, oh, Springboard for the Arts operates Creative Exchange, a national platform for sharing free toolkits, resources, and profiles to help artists and citizens collaborate on replicating successful, engaging community projects. An economic and community development agency run by and for artists, Springboard provides programs that help artists make a living and a life, and programs that help connect communities to the creative power of artists. Let's give it up for Laura. I'd like to welcome Monty Hillman to the stage. He is the Senior Vice President of Real Estate Development at the St. Paul Port Authority and Port Consulting. Monty Hillman joined the St. Paul Authority team in 2005 after several years of local community development and state level environmental work. His peers named him the inaugural person of the year for Brownfield Renewal Magazine and a 40 under 40 by the Twin Cities Business Journal. For the past decade, he led the redevelopment of the former 3M World Headquarters facility on St. Paul's East Side in Beacons Bluff. We got some pictures about with that, returning over 1,000 jobs to the site. He leads the Port Authority's development team in Port Consulting, the Port's new statewide real estate consulting business. He's responsible for and speaks nationally about the Port's sustainable development mission and their green design review program. Give it up for Mani. And finally, I would like to rec uh, bring up Patrick Sieb. He is the Director of Economic Development and Placemaking at the Destination Medical Center. Patrick Sieb directs economic development and placemaking activities at DMC, which is a 20-year, $5.6 billion plan intended to position Rochester as the world's premier destination medical center. With $585 million allocated by the state of Minnesota for public infrastructure support, DMC is the largest public-private economic development partnership in the history of the state. So let us welcome Patrick. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Russ. Okay, sounds good. Um, looks like we're, uh, we're missing one stool. So for the tech folks in the back, if we have a stool for Patrick, that'd be great. Um, also, I just want to double check with Briante, 
We're scheduled to go for an hour. Do you need us to shave a little bit off of that? A little bit, okay. So we're gonna be brief in what we say. Hopefully we'll have time to uh, allow you to ask some questions. Um, and I'm gonna go first uh, and talk a little bit about uh, the work of my organization very briefly. We have a world premiere video that we're gonna show you of some of the work that we do as coalition organizers and working at the community level and helping community organizations to cut an issue, to frame up their work, to navigate complex governmental systems, and to promote uh, equitable and sustainable development at the neighborhood level or at the district level. Very similar to the mission of the Eco District Summit today, uh, which I didn't know about the Eco District uh, conferences uh, until a few weeks ago. So um, I'm very excited about uh, our participation in that. And I see now that we have a, a stool for Patrick, uh, we don't have to play musical stools, which was gonna be what I was gonna suggest. So I know they're queuing up my video. Um, I, I would just say go ahead and get that video playing and I'll stop talking as soon as I know it's running. Um, the Alliance is a coalition of uh, over 30 organizations that work on economic and uh, economic justice, racial justice issues in the way that our Twin Cities area grows and develops. Um, we've been around for about 24 years now and we work on affordable housing, public transit, uh, we work in community, organize coalition campaign tables, um, also do convenings, and I see the videos playing, so I'm going to let that go once we get the sound. On the west side, we're using the Equitable Development Scorecard as a tool to center the voice of the people in development. My vision for the West Side, I think our collective vision, is that the people who live here have opportunities to build wealth, have safe schools, safe and thriving neighborhoods where our culture is reflected, where people are happy and know that they're not going to be displaced. What I know about the history of the West Side is that um, the Dakota people were actually across the river near downtown and were originally displaced from there over to the West Side and then waves of displacement have followed. And the poorest of the poor, the immigrants to St. Paul, settled on the West Side Flats. Decisions were made at the city that forced families off of that land in a way that was very traumatic. We've had an erased history, and so if we collectively forgot these people in this history, then my hope is that by the work that we do now, that we will collectively remember them and bring that story to the forefront and make sure that doesn't happen again. Today, the West Side continues to be a place for newcomers. About 55% of our residents are persons of color. One in five residents were born outside of the United States. And over a third of the people who live here speak a language other than English. The West Side is rich in cultural assets and contributions, and is also threatened today through decades of disinvestment, setting us up for a rapid gentrification with a lot of the vacant land that we have on the west side. There's a lot of space for developers to come in and put in some high density, and usually that means costly apartments and condos and places that will not be affordable to our neighbors. So now's the time for us to articulate our vision and set our standards for the community. So the scorecard can be a tool to work with developers and hopefully do some healing of the generations of displacement that have happened. Maybe seven years ago now, there was a group of organizations at the table uh, to begin to talk about what the scorecard could be, what it could look like, and over time develop the Twin Cities Equitable Development Scorecard. So the Alliance is still convener of the organizations to come together and continue the process of the scorecard work. Each of us are working on adapting the scorecard for our own purposes. In our scorecard, we've laid out hopes and expectations that we put together over the course of about a year. We've been refining it in small groups and in community outreach events, and we have several pillars, environment, economic development, community engagement, equitable housing, transportation, and land use. Through the scorecard work that we're doing, it is imperative for us to include the voices of our community. The wisdom of our elders, the voices of our youth, folks with different abilities, people of color, our renters, our homeowners, business owners, and honor everybody's lived experience. Residents were eager to come out and to be a part of this. It is telling to us that our neighborhood is really hungry for this. We had about 
25 solid individuals um, continue to dive into the scorecard. We now have a drafting team and a engagement team and we expect it to continue to evolve. Uh, we will go to the City Planning Commission in the fall of this year. We want to make sure that if this gets adopted by the city or by another government entity that there's still uh, power in how it's used with the community and so it can't be imposed as a tool upon the community. Um, it won't serve its purpose if it's used in that way. So with the spirit of sharing, we do hope that the scorecard gets developed and used in other communities, that communities can say, here's the issue that's facing us, and here's what's important to us, and adapt it so that they can convey to their partners or stakeholders or developers what they want to see. Enough people have heard about it that developers are starting to reach out to us and say, um, we hear that you have a scorecard, we hear that your community has opinions, uh, how can we meet with you? Which is a great sign that the tool will be useful. Nothing about us without us is for us, right? Our stories make and sustain the community that we're in, and so it's important that they're all heard. Folks now have a sense of hope that their voices can count and they do matter. And um, rather than being victims of something, we are protectors and healers. So that's the video. If you liked it, give us a round of applause. So I'd be remiss not to point out that Sean Pierce, among all the hats she's worn over the last few years, uh, also worked at the Harrison Neighborhood uh, Association as their executive director and helped lead the coalition of community groups that crafted the scorecard so many years ago. And it's intended as a tool for communities uh, to kind of get their arms around the jargon and the ideas that go into development decisions and to get around the old pattern of uh, developers and cities kind of having the conversation and sort of the community being on the outside. Instead, the scorecard intent was to center the conversation in community and to make sure that decisions are made mutually and that mutual interests are shared and that a dialogue happens. Um, and getting around the jargon and the confusing complexity that goes into a development project uh, and over almost a dozen different community groups and agencies are looking at using this scorecard. If you're, more, if you're interested in digging into this and maybe applying it in your own communities, our uh, website was up there on, on the screen. It's uh, thealliancetc.org. Um, and we've got a lot of information on the scorecard and a regional equity agenda that we're launching as well that we've built up with communities. Um, all of these are conversations about how communities can leverage the changes that they're experiencing right now, which I think is also a theme among the work of our panelists. Uh, in the old days, we used to think about how do you manage these changes, these demographic uh, shifts that we're seeing that are very dramatic in Minnesota. Uh, we are not just a lily white uh, or uh, state anymore in any neighborhood, in any regional center like Rochester, a small rural town that uh, might have major employers or certainly not in the Twin Cities metro area. We are becoming much more diverse. We see it in our schools. We're seeing it in our workforce. How do you leverage that change? How do you approach that from an assets-based uh, philosophy and not, work, not a, a deficits philosophy? So that's uh, how I'm gonna tee up the panel. I'm gonna let Russ Stark from a former city council member uh, at the city uh, kind of start us off on the panel. We'll bookend this, we'll have Minneapolis get the last say, uh, so that'll be Sean, and we'll just go down the line and let folks ta say a little bit briefly about the work they're doing and the challenges they face. Well, thank you, Russ, uh, appreciate it, and it's uh, great to be here this morning. On behalf of uh, my boss, uh, Mayor Melvin Carter, I was gonna say across the river, but we're on the east side of the river for those of you who know local geography. Um, uh, welcome to, uh, uh, to the Twin Cities, to those of you who are guests. Uh, I'm just gonna talk uh, for a few minutes about a few projects uh, that we are in the midst of in St. Paul, um, big projects. Uh, the, uh, when about uh, 10 years ago, it was announced that uh, the Ford Motor Company was gonna be shutting down the, their uh, plant in St. Paul in Highland Park where they had made Ford Rangers for many years. Um, it's actually more than 10 years ago. 
uh, the, the city kind of uh, created a, a big uh, community process, a stakeholder group, uh, to start work and thinking about that site. Um, and uh, we are just now uh, at the point of really in-depth conversations with a potential site buyer about what's going to happen on the Ford site. I'm actually going to get there in a second. This slide I'm going to start with is a rendering of what we call the Snelling Midway site. Um, and uh, this is a 30 or so acre site right along the Green Line, right in the middle of St. Paul in the Midway. Um, that was an old 1950s shopping center for many years with literally a big vacant piece of land between that shopping center and, and I-94. Um, where, uh, So it, it, look, looking at this rendering in the foreground, you can actually see my house if it was accurately portrayed. Uh, the, the, the stadium is, is uh, largely constructed now. The rest of the site doesn't look anything like the rendering yet. The stadium was literally the first piece of the development happening. But I wanted to talk about this particular development because it, was, it has been the culmination of many years of the city thinking about how to do stacked green infrastructure. Um, along the green line, we've had this ongoing conversation about how to get to the point of, especially for these larger site developments, doing what we call stacked green infrastructure, meaning district-wide stormwater solutions and stacking actual assets, in this case a park, uh, on top of them. So literally, if we'll, and some of you, if you join us later on one of the tours, we're going to be touring uh, this site and the Ford site. I encourage you to think about uh, joining us riding the Green Line and the A-Line uh, to get there. Um, but the, the, uh, the, uh, you see in the foreground of the rendering two park spaces, uh, if you will. Uh, and right now, under construction, is this massive stormwater tank underground. I think it's literally a 650,000-gallon tank. Um, and what's significant about that is it will actually be the stormwater system for the whole 30-acre site, not just the stadium itself. The city is investing in this new infrastructure in a way that we never have before. Um, and it's really exciting because it creates the opportunity for the rest of the development as that unfolds to plug into this new infrastructure without having to treat stormwater individually, parcel by parcel, on, on their own sites. For those of us into kind of stormwater and resilience, it's really exciting. For those of you, it may be not the most exciting thing you've ever heard, but anyway, we're, we're really excited about it. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Laser porn air if you want to use it. Oh, thanks. Um, and uh, so more, more about that on the tour uh, this afternoon. Getting back to the Ford site for a moment, I, I started out describing that, and uh, the Ford site is 122 acres uh, right along the Mississippi in the middle of the Mississippi National Recreation Area, which is literally a national park uh, across the river from, from Minneapolis down there, uh, and one of those really once-in-a-generation opportunities that cities sometimes get to, to reimagine a neighborhood out of a really unfortunate situation, which was a lot of jobs lost when the when the... Uh, plant shut down. So literally I mentioned 10 years of, of planning and we're now kind of culminating in potentially uh, uh, a really massive development. Actually just went public uh, several days ago. The plans of Ryan Companies, a local construction company developer, uh, that are very consistent with the master plan that the city had adopted last fall when I was still on the council. Um, essentially, it's planned to be uh, mixed-use development, uh, pre predominantly housing, but with a fair amount of office and commercial and retail fronting the major corridor Ford Parkway that crosses the river. Um, and what's really exciting here is that through those 10 years of planning, a lot of really thoughtful work went into thinking about what's the opportunity to really build that next generation community here along the river particularly in terms of both sustainability and equity. And the plan calls for 20% of the housing units to be affordable, but half of those at 30% of area median income, which is a standard that we've never, frankly, tried to meet before in a, in a large development in St. Paul. Um, here's, a, here's a rendering of an image of, again, a shared uh, stormwater system that would actually be an amenity for the development, a, a water feature. 
um, to give you a sense of kind of what the, what the area might look like and, and feel like uh, once it is built out. Uh, there, the, the big opportunity in terms of uh, energy on the site is to work with the developer, Ryan Companies, to figure out how to make these buildings as energy efficient as possible. We have a, a policy in St. Paul around uh, green building and design that says that uh, any project receiving 200,000 or more of city funds has to meet a really high bar of energy efficiency. And so we're working with the developer to figure out exactly how they can meet that goal. It's called SB 2030, it's developed by the state of Minnesota, and we've adopted it as our standard and projects the city is investing in. And as well, we commissioned a study of the site in terms of energy systems that have identified the possibility of a district heating and cooling system using the aquifer on the site as the first source of both heating and cooling, um, and then heat pumps to, to make up the difference. That system could, uh, in an energy efficient uh, development, make up about 40% of the energy need of the site, really reducing the carbon impact. And the goal here is, frankly, is, is net zero, or at least mm. carbon neutral ready uh, when this development goes in, because our electricity sources are getting more and more renewable over time. We're trying to figure out ways on the thermal energy side to make it possible for this site to be net zero at full build out. Just really briefly on one more location, uh, we, we talk about once in a generation at the Ford site, but we actually have a second 100 plus acre site in St. Paul that is up for sale and possible redevelopment. It is literally in the opposite corner of St. Paul, the northeast corner. Uh, Maplewood borders it on both sides. It's the Hillcrest Golf Course site. And we are just starting to think about what the potential of this site is, as well as looking at uh, those same opportunities for energy and stormwater systems, uh, what's the right mix of uses, et cetera. The, the golf course was actually sold uh, a number of years ago from the original owners to our local pipe fitters union. Um, and they are a, a willing partner in, with the city and making sure that we're doing something really fantastic at this site as well. So I'll stop there, but look forward to your questions and more conversation. Great, thanks. Monty. Welcome everyone, welcome to the Twin Cities. Uh, the St. Paul Port Authority has been around for 85 years. Uh, we've redeveloped 24 business centers, including four river shipping terminals uh, that house over 550 companies and over 25,000 jobs. Uh, many of these 25,000 jobs are uh, low barrier to entry jobs that help lift people out of poverty. The last 10 years, we've spent redeveloping the former 3M World Headquarters, uh, the original home of William McKnight, as you heard earlier. Uh, into Beacon Bluff Business Center. Uh, the project has to date returned 1,000 jobs to the site, uh, and this is in one of the most diverse neighborhoods that suffers from some of the worst disparities in our region. Uh, in doing that, we've done some things that are very well aligned with the imperatives, the priorities uh, within the Eco District Protocol. Uh, we look forward to great gaining more understanding of the protocol throughout these next couple of days here. Uh, to do this work, we're partnering with local philanthropic groups like McKnight uh, in the Eastside Employment Exchange to streamline the connection between the businesses we bring to these sites and the local neighborhood workforce service providers to improve and increase local hiring. Uh, we're also uh, tracking carbon and energy performance in all the buildings that go up at this site. Uh, voluntarily, and by voluntarily I mean we require it in our sale contracts with the companies that buy land from us. Uh, we built the hub in partnership with the Eastside Arts Council, a local neighborhood arts group. Um, this is the first net zero energy plaza in the country, uh, at least I'm claiming. You can tell me different if you have one or know of one, but until I hear it, <laughs> we're going to claim it. Uh, solar powers all the irrigation and site lighting out here. Um, this is an, one component of an educational streetscape with historic interpretive information, uh, energy information, and stormwater demonstration information. So uh, this, in this stormwater demonstration area, you see these uh, silver panels at the bottom of each of these images. You see the little turtle and the little shell and the little garbage can. Those are actual actuators, and when you move them up, the H2O molecule at the top of each of those big arcs releases a stream of water which shows you how that water would be absorbed in nature or in conventional civil engineering, on the right there as you can imagine, 
uh, or with next generation check technologies. Uh, that is filter pave, a crushed glass aggregate uh, that you'll hear more about in a second. Why we built that uh, is because of what you can't see at Beacon Bluff. Uh, we were developing the northern chunk of red is Beacon Bluff, and in doing so, we realized there was a big four-foot pipe cutting right through a great development site. Big stormwater pipe. Uh, doing our engineering work, we realized it was a subwater shed to the north of about 144 acres that drained completely untreated into bigger and bigger pipes. When it finally got into our site, it wound up in a 100-year-old brick storm tunnel that basically injected 150 acres of runoff into the Mississippi untreated. Uh, not great for water quality, not great for flooding, and all sorts of other uh, risks. So we had the obligation to figure out how far we could go on the continuum of environmental efficacy. How restorative of a system could we build? This is what we built. Uh, it's a uh, utility scale, uh, about a football field in size. Uh, you don't see any of this uh, except for what's on the surface. Um, and one of the things we realized in having conversations was there's a dearth of data of performance of underground infiltration systems of this type and design, scale and design, uh, as it relates to infiltration rates uh, over the long term, water quality, et cetera. So uh, one of these pipes, data sampling pipes on the left for water quality, infiltration uh, on the right, and we realized we would never get the data below this very expensive 40-foot deep system unless we installed that instrumentation while we were building it. Um, so we're currently gathering that data and using that to inform public policy as it relates to development and stormwater management. Uh, one of our other sites, uh, Crosstown, uh, we are now actually testing these permeable technologies, more conventional on the left, uh, filter pave on the right in a paved area of one of our projects. Uh, I see our partner from United Properties out here in the audience that uh, helped us think through how to actually install, and more importantly, to Mayor Fry's point earlier, how to pay for it. If we can't figure out how to do these sustainable technologies in a market context, we're really limited to throwing grant money at them uh, and really limits their ability to take off in the marketplace. Uh, Allianz Field, uh, you heard Russ talk about it. Uh, we are a consultant on the project. We're managing about eight, $10 million of environmental cleanup. Uh, so I spend a lot of times with the engineers, and Russ is right, that beautiful park everyone's walking on there, we just finished installing some gigantic storm sewer infrastructure that will reuse 600 some thousand gallons a year for irrigation of the entire 36 acre superblock. Our most recent challenge is we are uh, working with the development community to figure out how to build net zero. Uh, so we literally created a prototypical 60,000 square foot office warehouse building prototype that we are now out shopping to the marketplace trying to figure out the economics of how do we do that in a market context. We're getting great reaction across the spectrum uh, from the development community, and I think this is something we can actually get out of the ground in the near future here. So with that, I'll turn it over. Oh, there we go. Great. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Laura Zabel. I'm the executive director of an organization called Springboard for the Arts. Springboard is based here in Minnesota, both in the Twin Cities. We have an urban office in St. Paul and in a community called Fergus Falls. And that idea of urban-rural exchange is really important and foundational to our work. We work with about 25,000 artists in Minnesota every year. And then we also run a national platform called Creative Exchange that's home to toolkits that people can use all across the country to replicate successful community and creative projects, um, both from our work, but also from organizations and artists and activists all across the country. Uh, those projects have been replicated in about 80 different uh, cities and communities of all different sizes. Um, what our work looks like is really about reciprocity between artists and their communities and communities and their artists. So we support artists' ability to make a living and a life, their own economic opportunity through programs like healthcare and entrepreneurship training. And then we also make programs that are about how communities tap into that power that artists bring. Uh, and the reason that we do that work um, to use an analogy that may resonate for some of you, is that we believe that 
artists, cultural practice, creativity is a natural resource. It's a natural resource that exists in every neighborhood, on every block, uh, includes people who may identify themselves as artists, but also people who have other kinds of cultural practice or cultural tradition, people who may not use that sort of capital A art uh, definition for themselves. But that natural resource exists um, every place. It's an asset that exists every place. But just like a lot of other natural resources, uh, you can live in a really sunny community, but you don't necessarily have access to solar energy unless someone builds solar panels. Uh, and that's our work, is that kind of infrastructure building, mechanism building that helps us tap into and plug into the creative thinking, the creative power, uh, and the cultural relevance of communities and neighborhoods. Um, and I think in terms of how our work fits into some of the work that all of you do and, and the rest of, of my fellow panelists, I think my experience in community and economic development is often that uh, even when we are working towards just and equitable community health, we often sort of start at a transactional or um, problem-solving mode. And I would say that our work is really about helping us start from the place of meaning-making. How do we root these kinds of big community changes in cultural practice, in people's own creative ideas? How do we use creativity to build power and agency of people in places so that whatever change comes, whatever development comes, is informed by the people who are already there, the people who have contributed to that place uh, for the long term? Um, just a quick example of what that looks like. Uh, in our rural office in Fergus Falls, one of the biggest community challenges there is a vacant, for about 15 years, state mental hospital. Um, it's a beautiful historic building. It's 750,000 square feet of vacant space in a community of 13,000 people. It's pretty much big enough the whole town could move in there together <laughs> and live there. So far, no one's taken me up on that idea. Um, but the community has had a very adversarial relationship, and this, this sort of core issue has overshadowed every other development issue, every other sort of future-focused economic development project in Fergus Falls. And the conversation at one point had really devolved into an argument about we have to tear it down, we can't tear it down. These being the only two options. Uh, and we started working with creative folks in, the, in Fergus Falls um, and started with a very small, humble project that we called What Else is Possible? We made a big chalkboard silhouette of that building and we wrote, what else is possible? And that question helped turn a conversation towards possibility, towards future focus, and started bringing new people to the table, um, started engaging creative people in all kinds of different ways. Fast forward six years, we've done probably over 100 small projects in and around that building that bring community members onto the site, that help people share ideas, share their vision for the building, and help to engage the community in a different kind of conversation. But what I think is important about that work and the, the piece that I want to share with you today uh, in particular is what I think art does in that situation is it helped us and it helped a lot of people in the community realize that what needed to happen before a conversation about redevelopment of this historic space was for the community to have a real open and vulnerable conversation about the role that mental health treatment has played in their culture for the last hundred years. Hmm. The mental health hospital was the largest employer for over a hundred years. Everyone in the town has a story that's connected to that building either as an employee or as a patient or as a relative of someone who was institutionalized there. And there's a lot of pain and shame and trauma and joy and pride connected to that building. And unless we give people the outlets for those stories, unless people feel that those stories are held, unless people have a place to come together and have those harder, deeper, more human conversations, they're never gonna be able to decide what to do with the building. And I think that's, that's the kind of process we're interested in, that's the kind of role we're interested in playing. We did, uh, although around a very different kind of community change and community issue, a similar kind of set of projects and work with creative people along the construction of the Green Line in St. Paul. Um, and similarly, a project we started from the perspective of how do we support small businesses during huge construction disruption. Over three years and 600 artists and 200 projects projects in the neighborhoods 
came to be much more about how do neighborhoods, how do folks who have lived and grown up and been in these neighborhoods for generations, how do they reclaim the narrative of these places? How do we make sure that as development comes, people know who lives here already? People know the stories of the people and the cultures that have shaped these, narrative, er, shaped these neighborhoods already. Um, and that project along the Green Line really led us to a big project we're engaged in right now. We uh, this summer purchased a vacant car dealership on University Avenue right along the Green Line in St. Paul. Uh, it's a small 8,000 square foot building in a 50 car asphalt parking lot uh, and we're in the process of redeveloping that site um, to be a permeable space, a green space for the neighborhood, but also home to an artist and maker market, a place for community ideas and cultural gathering space. I think that's another important piece as you think about the kind of district planning you want to do is where are the spaces for creative thinking? Where are the really low barrier accessible places where people can go with their idea and say, I want to figure out how to do this in my neighborhood, or I need to bring my neighbors together to organize around a particular issue. Uh, where are those spaces that feel comfortable for a lot of different kinds of people, and where are there places where people can claim that narrative and kind of own their role in their neighborhood and build power and agency for themselves and with their neighbors. Um, I'm also doing a, a panel tomorrow. If, I, if you want to hear more about those stories in, in much more depth, I'm, I'm happy to share more. Wait, way too. to work the plug in. Right? Um, I'm panel, an artist. I know how panel, to plug. Panel members, you're doing a great job. Uh, please keep staying brief so that we have a little bit of time for questions. I'm going to take the questions out to the audience. I'm not going to ask any. So as soon as they're done, we'll get your questions the, uh, ready. Good morning. I'm Patrick Sieb with Destination Medical Center in Rochester, Minnesota. And I think of us as the third of the Twin Cities. <laughs> so, you can do the math on that. Um, so I just wonder if there's the right way to advance this. There we go. Um, so again, thank you. It's, I'm really pleased to be a part of this, uh, part of this program. I see many friends and colleagues and uh, of course a lot of people I haven't met uh, in today's audience. I'm going to just describe briefly this big initiative going on in Rochester called Destination Medical Center. Our mission statement is on the screen and embedded in that entire mission statement is this notion of sustainability, this idea of building America's city for health. And, and it's sort of a core value and a core principle as we think about this dramatic transformation that will take place in Rochester. Uh, we've developed a set of goals that talk about the, uh, the, the, the vision and the plan for the city, the idea of leveraging public investment to catalyze private development, and really ultimately to change the city to, in a way that achieves the highest quality patient and resident and community member experience. Um, as I mentioned, um, so Rochester, for those of you who are not familiar with this geography, is 75 miles south of the Twin Cities. And more and more, I think in the fullness of time, it will be recognized as one regional market. And, and it was quite compelling to hear uh, Mayor Fry um, address the audience this morning. I spent the last few days with him at a conference in Nashville and he is both an incredible leader for this community, but his voice really resonates in other parts of the state as well. And that's why the power of having visionary leaders, both here and, and the new mayor of St. Paul, really it changes the conversation, not only in these communities, but across the state. Uh, Rochester itself, a town of 110,000 people, 70% um, college educated, it's very well off by, by most standards. Um, it is home to Mayo Clinic, so many people know of and heard of Mayo Clinic. It's a national and international brand. Uh, in the city of Rochester, there are 34,000 employees at Mayo Clinic. So picture that, a town of 110,000, 34,000 people work in one corporation. So when we think about sustainability, one, one part of sustainability is economic sustainability, and the idea of diversifying the economy is first and foremost um, on our minds. Um, just uh, uh, with Russ's encouragement, I'm going to move more quickly through some of these slides um, and just say that um, our initiatives, um, as we think about sustainability, it is environment and energy and, um, and economic 
and uh, transportation. So a big part of our effort is to rethink the transportation model in Rochester. I would say that we perfected the single occupancy vehicle mode of transportation in Rochester. We do it as well as anybody in the country, and I dare you to challenge me on that. <laughs> but we are, and, and having perfected that, we have the opportunity to create more options and to rethink how people get about and, and live in our community and get to work and get to their places of business. Uh, one of the pushbacks we hear in our community is, is change and the amount of change. And Russ, before the program, said we ought to, the theme really is around change. And I, I tell people in, the, in our community there's really two kinds of cities. There are cities that are going to change and be victim to that change, and there are cities that are going to change and control their destiny. And we want to be the latter. We want to be a city that understands change is inevitable, cities are changing, and that we want to be in, in control of that direction. Um, one of the smartest things I've done in the three years that I've been in Rochester with Destination Medical Center is to hire Kevin Bright, who is our, Kevin is at the back of the room kind of shaking, he's kind of, uh, there's Kevin. Uh, so some of you may have met him yesterday. Say hello, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin is our Director of Energy and Sustainability, um, works for Destination Medical Center. We are an independent nonprofit, really an agent of the state, and uh, also 20% with the City of Rochester. So we created a really great model where he works with, with both us and the City of Rochester. And some of you may have heard him uh, speak yesterday as a part of the research session. He'll be around for the entire conference, and you should meet him if you haven't already. Um, as he thinks about approaches that we may take around district energy, um, the sustainability culture, really building a, sustain a culture of sustainability in our community, and, um, and applying that work to individual projects. People have said to me, what is this DMC project anyway? Well, this DMC project is literally hundreds of projects that will come together and thousands of decisions that will get made over time. And I think about the former mayor of Indianapolis, Mayor Hudnick, who said one time that uh, he grew up on a cattle ranch in South Dakota, and he said, if you wanted to improve the average of the quality of your herd, you didn't replace the entire herd at one time, but every time you added to your beef stock, you added a better grade, better quality, and over time you increase the average. And I think that's really the opportunity that we as cities have, that every decision is better than the last decision, that we advance the, because we can't change everything at once, but we can do what Monty is doing at, at the Port Authority and, and others, that every decision is better than the last decision and you incrementally advance and dramatically over time the average quality of your city, in this case around energy and the environment. Um, and we're building a soccer, no, that's your, <laughs> that's your slide. Okay. Thank you, that's my slides. Yes, I'm good. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, we can do better than that. It's not even 11. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Outstanding. Um, by a show of hands, just put your palms up if you consider yourself uh, new to eco districts but excited uh, or new to environmental justice work. All right, thank you. And if you consider yourself someone who's maybe studied this, done a lot of work, and you have not worked directly with people of color, raise your hands. Don't be embarrassed. Awesome, great, that's where we're gonna start. So, uh, as uh, I think Russ or Briante said, I'm Sean Pierce. I work with Mayor Fry. Uh, I'll say a few things uh, about what my work is so that when we go to questions, you can ask. I'm responsible for leading our Opportunity Zones work for the city, uh, comprehensive plan in our office, economic development, business development, workforce, and all things not policing, community relations, or affordable housing. Cool? So ask about those things. Uh, I like to start from an acknowledgement of where we are as a country and where we are as a region and a city because we like to talk about our projects from this transactional place and the reality is we are where we are today because of our histories, right? So the history of our country as a reminder for those of us who think about this all day and as a notice, I guess for those of us who are new to this, is that we are the product, a very successful product of forced labor primarily through the slave trade of African Americans, and I'm really specific about that. Many of us are actually descendants of slaves or people who were actually free people here before colonizers showed up and then were enslaved. 
Uh, we are on stolen land, both the native community that was here, but also the Mexican or Tenochtitlan, where land was taken through westward expansion and a host of other realities. So, you know, we think about and we talk about affordable housing, we talk about business ownership, and the reality is that the wealth that is um, in existence right now is actually a result of theft. It is not this sort of pull yourself by, up by your bootstraps mentality that we like to have. I was reading this article and someone was like, and I worked hard and I started my business. I was like, that's cute. So did Jeff Bezos, right? You know? So I say that because the work around economic inclusion and eco districts is a return to uh, really the work of acknowledging the contributions that people have made to the success of our companies, the successes of our cities, and the successes of our country. And without those contributions, free and forced labor, stolen ideas, stolen land, the list goes on, we wouldn't be where we are today in the United States. So people really... Thanks. Thank you. And that's really, really important because what we're talking about up here is investments. We're talking about dollars. And we're in a state in this country where we're entering wealth calcification. That means that most of us, even if you make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year and you call yourselves the middle class, we're actually working class people. And many of us or our family members or our neighbors are working poor people, right? Like if you have to go to work to put your children through college, you're actually working class. Middle class is great, but that's not where most of us are. And when we start to, to, as a city or as a region, talk about investment, we often start to hit walls of fear. Because many of us know that our families have struggled. Whether you're black or brown or white, in this country, most of our families have struggled. And we're afraid of losing what we think we've earned at this point. But our reality is that we're going to be better together. But we're not gonna be better together by pretending that we have this new wave of black, brown, and immigrant communities that are gonna start booming our economies and filling our job vacancies. That's not the reality, right? There's a reason why Mayor Fry spoke about folks of color being the entrepreneurs, CEOs, and leaders of today because we always have been. So the, the greatest challenge, and I think that was the question that you originally asked for us, I think our greatest challenge is realizing that we have hit a wall as a city, we've hit a wall as a region, we've hit a wall as a country where we can't grow if we don't finally get out of our own ways. So in a really practical way, what we've been doing as a city is one, saying to some of our most amazing partners, we love you, we continue to embrace the work that you're doing, and we are now going to very intentionally pave the way through resources, policies, practices, and meetings with black, brown, and indigenous people to come and actually be the leaders of their own work. It takes us... It takes us exponentially longer, exponentially longer to convince someone who has no relationship to community to understand that community and to be able to scale a solution. That is a net loss in terms of investment. And that doesn't mean that allies and partners are not amazing. But if I want to figure out how to close the financial wealth gap in the black community, I shouldn't go and ask really wealthy white people. <laughs> right? Because the way that we've survived as black people in this country has been to create Wall Streets. Right? It has been to create cooperative systems. It has been the like, feeding of our neighbors when food was scarce in our communities. It's been rebuilding our institutions when they were burned to the ground. We already know how to work together. So I don't need to go and ask someone how to fix my community, right? So we're very intentionally doing that. That's why we're investing in the Village Financial Cooperative because they've said no to predatory lending, whereas some of our partners in the financial institution have launched things like nude small dollar lending at $1,000 limits with 71% interest rate. They're saying, you know what? We can actually figure out how to get loans and credit to people who have, I don't know, like 400 for credit score. Right? We're figuring out how to turn the fact that many of our residents actually pay between $1,700 and $2,000 a month for rent. They have mold in, in their, on their walls. Some of them don't even have ceilings, and yet they can't move into home ownership. That's actually ridiculous. It's, it's asinine, actually. Right? Because if you can pay that amount of money for three years straight, you can afford to pay a mortgage. 
And you don't deserve to be treated like crap when you go into a bank and someone looks at your credit score and they don't take into account your, your payment history and your family circumstance. So that's, that's really where we're at and I think our greatest challenge is acknowledging that if it weren't for our philanthropic partners like a McKnight, like a Jay and Rose Phillips Family Foundation, and our amazing developers like Thor, like United Properties and others, the city can't do it alone, right? The county can't do it alone. The state can't do it alone. So, so we're changing the way we think about the work and we need actually brilliant minds like you all to join us in that. So a quick plug for us, we're gonna be out at a few really outstanding sites. Minneapolis is literally the economic engine of our state and I love all of our neighbors. <laughs> but we are, right? We have the greatest population, the most um, Re revenue, har highest amount of taxes, and we also will drain the greatest amount of resources, right? We are the economic engine of our state, and therefore we have to be a leader in moving toward just systems. So today we're gonna be out at Upper Harbor Terminal. You can visit Bassett Creek Valley. Uh, there are a couple, Tower Side is amazing. We need folks who are incredibly creative and who are not gonna have theoretical conversations about solutions, but can bring tried and true innovative strategies, but also systems that have worked in your cities to those tables. Please join us. The Upper Harbor Terminal redevelopment site is, uh, you've heard what the mayor had to say, the one thing I want you all to know is that has been 10 years in the making. It is adjacent to the only communities in our state that are slated for the greatest amount of in transit investment over the next decade, probably the next few generations. So if we can't get that right, then we will fail actually our state. Right? If you come over to Towerside, we have shared principles, it's adjacent to Motley, and we have shared principles around equity and inclusion. There's much, much more to be said. Um, we could talk about how all of those sites are actually in an opportunity zones. I was talking with some folks about like, well, what's the three minutes on opportunity zones? We can share that. But just thank you for being here. Remember that most of our ideas are not new, and to let the people who are most impacted lead the work. Thank you, Sean. Thank you to all the panelists. That was awesome. Sean's going to be there at Upper Harbor Terminal for that one. Yes. Right? So you can ask her more questions about that. Uh, so we're going to turn it out to the audience here. Got a question. Uh, I'm going to try to move fast in the questions. Question on the left. The, oh. the, the good news is that um, you're getting a little bit more extended time to ask questions. The bad news is 15 minutes is being shaved off your break. Uh, hi, this is a question for the gentleman from the, the Mayo Clinic and the DMC. Um, the, the medical tourism and the influx of money into the DMC um, is going to have big implications for the city of Rochester, but also for, uh, for Minneapolis. Can you talk about concrete ways that you're working into your plan, other community benefits agreements, insurance of affordability, and can you speak to it as to how you're not just dealing with the city of Rochester, but also recognizing that you're the third leg of the tr Twin Cities. How are you being able to influence the city of Minneapolis preparing for this? And very briefly. Uh, wow. Uh, so, first of all, thank you for that question, and I think what you're, what you're asking is how does the work of Mayo Clinic, which itself is a global brand attracting people from around the country and around the world, how can that, uh, how do they interact with the city of Rochester? I, I think that's part of what I'm hearing. Um, and, and I would just say this, that um, a, a lot of cities have the same experience that Rochester has had, which is a major, a major education or, or um, healthcare institution operating in a very insular way. Um, and sort of taking care of itself and doing really well at taking care of itself. And you can, and I was just in Nashville, I mentioned this uh, uh, with Mayor Fry and others, um, and Vanderbilt had the same experience, and Nashville had the same experience with Vanderbilt, or Yale uh, in New Haven, where, uh, where, where those, those institutions look inward and they really don't embrace the community. And, and really that's the change that's happening now is that Mayo understands that it is, it needs to be part of the fabric of Rochester and part of the fabric of Rochester's growth, and for that matter, for the state's growth. And that's why the state of Minnesota invested so heavily in this initiative, not because it's a Rochester initiative, because it's a Minnesota initiative. 
Good morning, thank you so much. Um, pardon me, my name is Kat Gogenauer. Um, I created uh, the Right to Root campaign, but I'm very interested, Sean, in um, the work you're doing around economic development. And I'm wondering if you know that um, St. Paul and Minneapolis have two African-American financial capability initiatives funded and started by the Northwest Area Foundation. Um, my day job is providing technical assistance for those, I think, nearly 10 African-American led and serving um, organizations. And wondering really how you see getting community centered in your work and how we might be able to help you connect to that wonderful work happening here. Thank you for the question. Kat, yes? Yes. Um, yes, I am aware, very aware. Uh, there are tons of ways that I think you all could be at the table for us. Um, the mayor briefly mentioned cultural districts and cultural corridors. And part of, part of what we're doing, we have our big stakeholder meeting on Monday. And that's really to say we've been talking about this concept of keeping peop people in place and making sure that our policies and practices do not facilitate gentrification as a booming city, right? So I think we're going to need as many community-rooted and critical thinking partners in that conversation as possible, both on the design, right? We have to get this into the comprehensive plan for the city, um, but also Village Financial Cooperative and um, Northwest Area Foundation and Mita and Neon really need to be better connected, right? Because there's this, and this is another challenge for us in this market and in probably many of yours as well, we tend to operate from this competitive standpoint. And my analysis suggests that the Northwest Area Foundation and Mita and Village Financial Cooperative and all of these are actually unique subsections of creating a financial system that finally works for our people. But we can't do that if we're in silos and we're competing for the same sources of funding and attention. So I think first things first, let's get together and um, you know, like have a lunch and figure out how to map it all out. And then I suspect that, okay, things to know about Sean, I'm actually brutally honest. Um, I suspect that we're at some point gonna wanna get people together and just say like, we need everybody to put their egos aside and we need to move about in a new, in a new way. Um, just as an example, Russ mentioned the, the um, the scorecard and the relationship to Harrison. Uh, the scorecard was created really from the leadership of Harrison residents. And what they did was, you know, kind of acknowledging this relationship between um, heavy industrial freight rail and, and anticipating investment said, we think we need to operate differently and with more foresight. And so I think it's that sort of conversation that, that we can have and move, and move forward. Did that answer your question? Okay, thank you for the question. So we're uh, running out of time. I just want to uh, thank the panel for what they had to say and also remind us that um, in, in your schooling, in your work, in your grad schools, public policy, planning, um, in your professional careers, uh, a lot of folks did not study how to move along a racial equity continuum and how to talk about race and have that difficult conversation. And when Sean says, uh, you know, kind of reminds us of our historical background and the oppressions and the, the systematic and institutional racism that created our built environment, um, that's the easy conversation. Because she said it for you. You didn't have that conversation among your colleagues out in the community. Um, but we cannot advance equitable development without having some very uncomfortable conversations about race and white privilege. It's something that I professionally have, had, have been doing for quite a while, I'm constantly challenged as a white leader. And it's one of the things that uh, the only way this profession of urban planning is going to move into this next century of planning and, and really be able to carry that mantle of sustainable and equitable development is to have those kind of conversations, which we had briefly here. And you want to have the last word? No, no, no. I don't oh, want the last no, word. Okay. I just want to add to that piece. Is um, A lot of times when, when we're working with communities of color, you drag us into ongoing conversations right. about white fragility and white right. supremacy. We're not doing that as a city anymore. We're not asking people to tell us what we need to do. We're saying we're going to invest in a thing that normally is risky for the folks that don't yet understand. And so I would just encourage people not to try to start a conversation in a series of convenings about getting people on the same page, right. but to just make the investments and get out of the way and support the work. Right, right. that's great. All right, I wanna thank our panel today. Can we give them another round of applause?